Hello, everyone. So I would like to start with a small teaser that will lead then later on to, to conclusions of my talk. So can you show the video, please? It's not really uh, there's something wrong with the MOV files, probably. But it's even better, better effect. Should I click here, here? OK, good. So we go this way. Yeah, so um, during my studies, I have been always trying to combine my interest in art. And uh, basically, over, over the course, I could kind of twist it towards, towards more and more uh, brain sciences. So even though that I'm by training a, a telecom engineer, uh, later on, I was working with virtual reality and then uh, with clinical neuroscience and finally with brain-computer interfaces. Um, and why I'm interested in art is because um, I would like to build a machine. Because many thinkers, philosophers have been discussing uh, and describing art as, as the way how to, to kind of change yourself so that experiences we uh, we gain from books or films, they really change us. It's like a labyrinth. But uh, as an engineer, I took this uh, metaphor literally, and I would say, like, what it will take to build such a machine. Uh, so there are now technologies which allow you to, to see what, uh, what is happening in your physiological states and your brain. And uh, one of them is uh, so called inactive cinema or neuro cinema. And we have been exploring these concepts with various collaborators over a few years. Basically, in the neuro cinema concept, you, you think about the system where, let's say, you watch a film, and then the film becomes more and more scary. Or, I mean, maybe vice versa, if you're a child and, and, and the system detects that, that, that you reach the, your level of, of uh, stress. Uh, but what is the brain-computer interfaces? Uh, basically, every year we see more and more uh, films which are related to this kind of brain, uh, brain reading and, and, and thought reading and the decoding the uh, uh, states what, what people are in. And you all know about these films. I mean, Matrix, I think, that is one of the, the most, uh, let's say, um, philosophically uh, rich, even though the, the directors, I think, they didn't really explore it to the, to the maximum of the idea. Uh, but um, what is important here is that BCI can't really read the thoughts. It's, uh, it's a misconception. So, so what, what we can do is uh, we can still use the uh, BCI technology to, uh, to use it as, a let's say, a new type of mouse. So it's a control signals. Uh, it's true that maybe in the future, let's say, uh, we could get to more and more sophisticated control signals. But so far, um, what we can really do is, uh, is um, having a, a few dimensional control systems where you can say left and right or uh, up and down. So this is fine to controlling a wheelchair or prosthesis. I'll just also use the laser perspective. Yeah, OK, so you see I have a, uh, if that's, that's, this diagram is very important because many times what you see on the market, uh, it's also called VCI, but, but actually it's not. So Emotive is a good example of that. Uh, so in, in, the, in the system, the most important part is that it's loop. So it's a closed loop. So just 
recording brain activity uh, can be also called BCI, and sometimes people call it like effective BCI or uh, passive BCI, uh, but it might be also some kind of like a salesman trick. In a real system, you have a number of boxes which, which are quite, uh, quite specific. So, so first you have to record the signal and you have to get the signal as good uh, as possible. So uh, basically you have a systems also which can record uh, uh, from not only from the surface from the brain but, but also and subdurally. Uh, and uh, here is also a major difference between research in Europe and US because uh, the ethical um, committees and regulations are different. So uh, research in US have been concentrated basically on invasive BCI. Uh, so we all have seen these uh, videos of the monkeys uh, controlling the robotic arm and feeding themselves with banana. And, um, now, the signal acquisition part is, uh, is getting better. So, so we have now the active electrodes with uh, amplifiers inside on the, on, on the surface. And then also there is this part then about the signal processing. So again, the computers become more powerful. We, we have more processing power. We can get the things um, being faster. And then uh, what's important is how we can use these commands for controlling different devices. What I'm interested in is more, uh, can we control the media the way uh, we control the uh, wheelchair and, um, or internet portal? And uh, here then comes this, this, uh, this connection between media and uh, art and on one side and technology on another side. Uh, so my um, knowledge and, and kind of uh, first encounter with BCI technology was uh, uh, in 2010 when I joined the, the Austrian lab in Graz. This is, was one of the three main labs in the world which uh, were pushing this technology forward. So, so they have really pioneered a lot of things in this, uh, in this field. And, uh, in that project, we actually uh, were doing not research, but we had some kind of road mapping. We had to inform the commission what would be the future of these technologies in the, in the nearest future. So it was a very privileged position. So uh, we did like a lot of interviews with the main, uh, main people in the field. You can still see it on YouTube. Uh, and, and it was really interesting to see all these di different views on the development of this technology. So, one insight which, which uh, I really like is that it's, it's true that, that people are accepting more and more these technologies even inside their body. So one of the professors said that I am sure that in, uh, in a few, like in a decade, you will see people implanting something in their brain, like a new iPhone, you know? Imagine you'll have a cue for implanting the new version. Uh, but uh, we continued with this uh, idea uh, uh, of road mapping and kind of coordinating this, these activities within Europe. And that's where uh, this um, Brain Hack project uh, emerged. So it was a two-year project. It's now almost finishing. But uh, in this project, we really wanted to, to see how we can connect two different fields, which are almost not communicating between each other. So in one sense, there are these uh, uh, mad scientists who are doing re the research and sometimes they really don't even want to communicate with the uh, with public. I remember um, one of the American professors who was actually doing all these monkey uh, experiments. He has been like basically repeatedly approached by Hollywood and uh, as to be a consultant for all these films and he said I, I don't want, I mean it's like they are, they are just uh, uh, having, casting a bad image to this idea and uh, so so basically there is this miscommunication between the public interest and then you have the enthusiasts who are just building the interfaces themselves and even I know about community in US who is really doing uh, invasive BCIs without really clinical approval so they basically drill the I mean they are implanting it themselves <laughs> so there are I mean and you have seen probably also this all this uh, movements of uh, 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 DUI, the, the, where the people implant magnets and creating a sixth sense and so on. So, so there are many people experimenting 
with, with the body uh, beyond uh, just the simple tattoos. And it will just get worse. So uh, in this project, we wanted really to bring these two communities together and make them talk to each other. Uh, and we uh, used uh, hackathons as the instrument to do so. I also want to say that uh, BrainHack was uh, like a kind of a predecessor to this bigger initiative uh, from the Commission, which is called STARTS Initiative. So, so it's merging st uh, science, technology and art together. And there are a number of projects which are now going on until 2020. Actually, we collaborate with them. And you know, you all know about the Ars Electronica Festival. So, so there is also now a special Starts Prize for art science, uh, uh, let's say, performances and uh, events. Now, if you think about what art is usually doing with, with this physiological computing and uh, technologies, and uh, similar devices, it's, uh, it's, it's really um, not moving forward. So I, I was actually surprised when I saw that, that Alvin Lucier, who was pioneering the field in the 60s, he's still touring. <laughs> the guy is still touring now. <laughs> uh, it was the, the last year in, in Berlin. And what, what he does is that he just records a single, there's a single electron here, and then there is some kind of probably some, some sounds created by his brain activity. Uh, on the other side, if you think about uh, how, <coughs> how scientists or technologists think about art, so that's, that's what they do, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a paintbrush application, uh, which is driven by uh, Intendix. This is the most, one of the most advanced BCI systems. It's called based on P300, so you can, but it's really slow, you know, you can you imagine you have a paintbrush and then you have really slow mouse and you can just move and, and change some stuff. But that's what they call BCI and art in the technology world. <laughs> so you see that the, there are some misunderstanding or kind of misconception of what is art and what is science and putting them together, uh, it's always a challenge. So following the maker spirit, which is pretty strong and which is kind of growing. So people like to do things by their own hands. And, and also uh, now you have a number of toolkits. Uh, you have open BCI toolkit, which everybody can buy and just print your own headset. So <coughs> we decided to, to explore hackathons. And it, indeed, the hackathon is, is really a, a hot, uh, almost, almost overused uh, word nowadays. Uh, there is also the Cybertron. Uh, it's it's the BCI race, which is uh, every year uh, done in Switzerland, where you have people who are paralyzed on wheelchairs and they use BCI technology to also. It's basically like a uh, like a yacht race. Uh, then uh, IEEE had brain initiative, so they did like massive hackathons with sometimes um, over 300, 400 participants. And then we started with this Hack the Brain initiative from Black Society in Amsterdam, and we kind of extended that. So that's just an image of, uh, of two artists, uh, which are, uh, their performance was uh, the, called EG Kiss. So, so basically just they put the device on the head and they kiss and they say, we see what, what is happening. I mean, basically for every person with technical education, what you understand is it's a short circuit, what they're observing, but it's artistic project. Uh, well, anyway, in, in, the, in the hackathons, what we uh, carefully designed and invite people, we had a number of uh, observations, and it's true that it's, it's nice to see ideas generated. Uh, sometimes it's really... Um, mm, upsetting because you know people i don't know why i mean sometimes people really don't don't dream anymore they uh, most of the applications which we had and we still try it really to 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 push hard for real crazy artistic stuff or uh, but the applications or the ideas people explored were like uh, um, driverless car or kind of sensing for uh, for some disease or um, so, so it was really um, this entrepreneurship spirit is, is in the air. So crazy artists are rare these days. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, uh, the matchmaking and team forming, I think that this, this was one thing which we really saw that, that there you can really benefit when, when you cherry pick the best ideas and, and some of the projects which are now going on, like Vertigo, they really do that. So, so they first, for example, publish some idea from scientists and then they let artists apply and complement the idea. So I think that the more you kind of play with the ideation part, the, the better kind of the output would be. And uh, of course, the, the tools availability uh, uh, was really an issue because you know, building something during the workshop or even a hackathon, uh, it's, it's really difficult. And many times people will just say after two days that no, only now we are, we are ready to explore things. Uh, but, you know, hackathon or workshop is over. So then we came up with this idea of maybe reusing previous prototypes and, and for example, some company, GTEC, really did it. So in the last uh, hackathon in Dublin, they really massively brought the equipment and they kind of, they were the star of the event. They, they had the kind of ready-made product being able to for artists to be hacked and changed, and that was a good idea. But another idea which we had was like a long-term residences. So um, there was this idea of the spinal project. So we, we picked some of the most interesting um, ideas and we uh, followed them um, and helped them to develop. So uh, the project which I selected for to be followed was the Brain Dance. It was created. Uh, because of this original idea by Ivo Boss uh, on Berkel. Um, it's, it's a kind of simple show. There are two, two people, two dancers with brain-computer interfaces. It's basically um, a passive BCI, as I said before. So, so what is happening is just you're monitoring the activity of these people and, uh, and you visualize them with a laser. So when I was discussing that with, with, a, with a producer of the show, his main concern was not really to get the better interfaces, but he really concerned about better lasers to get. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the lasers are cool, and, and, and they are much more expensive than the devices. It's true. Uh, now, getting this idea, and then I was also, um, uh, while working in St. Petersburg for some years, um, in the scene, there was one guy, Yuri Ditovich, who was really interested in neurotheater and applying these ideas of, of BCI to theater. And his idea was, was extremely nice and, and, and different from, from everything what I heard from other people. So he basically said, you know, and you saw the BCI uh, scheme, you know, you have the, the sensors, you have devices, you have algorithms, but he was really he had really bad interface. It was like this motive thing, but he was torturing the actor, <laughs> the actress. So she was, he was selected the best actress, so the one who was really uh, doing the best with her brain, and then she was also training for several months to use the interface. And that was the kind of the part which is always, when, when we talk about these devices, we assume that they will be working just out of the box. You put it on the person and here you go. But it's like a bicycle. You need to learn how to use a bicycle and sometimes it takes time. I mean, I think that in the future, the main progress with BCI would be uh, achieved when you start using these technologies from the kindergarten. Because when you are kind of growing up with such device, then, then at a later stage it become really like your your third kind of like third hand or kind of additional channel. Uh, so, but anyway, we assembled the team, and uh, and we were lucky enough that Estonia had a presidency, uh, uh, and uh, they had a call for projects, and, and then we applied for this performance. So we wanted to do a neurotheater performance. It was selected, and we, we did it uh, this September in Brussels. Well, just uh, the main idea here was quite uh, ambitious, because we wanted not only two people on the stage, so we had two dancers. Originally, I was thinking about just actors, but then it, we converted to, to really two dancers. Uh, and then we had an idea that we have some people from the audience, so we just take people from uh, uh, who, who just came to the show, and we put them on the stage, also with the, the interfaces. And then 
the most important thing for me, of course, was this narrow cinematic system, which I could have the possibility to build. So, um, yeah, so basically we have this database narrow cinema part, which is between these two, two dancers, and then we have these people who are watching this interaction between two dancers and, and acting as an emotional filter. Um, so what I wanted to, to say that in, in this quite intense experience, because we have been working on this uh, show from May, and it was, uh, even though I was doing before this, uh, this kind of activities as well, we did some uh, multimodal brain orchestra in Prague, it was 2009. But there it was easy, because you just put people on the stage and then uh, you sonify in the brain. And it was almost like Alvin Lucier style. Uh, but here it was really a theater performance with a real theater, with, with buying the screens, uh, the uh, uh, understanding what we do with lights and so on. So, so it, it, it became bigger than I originally anticipated. Uh, but important thing was that apart from artistic vision, we also had the possibility to explore different ideas, scientific ideas. And that's the main point of this art science collaboration. So the topic one was, was this collective brain. So what we did is that we didn't use the brains of individual persons on the stage, but we really had the kind of a sum from four people, which was affecting this communication channel. Now, the neurocinematic part is my favorite one because, yes, uh, here we could really play with these ideas of database cinema. So, so what, what we are having here is that we had a number of videos uh, which we could assemble then. We, so we had this loop, but we assembled the videos, these video messages, uh, and we basically used for that uh, technology which is called semantic BCI. So semantic BCI is an, an emerging field, and it really based on this idea that um, apart from just detecting very simple um, uh, features, like let's say motor imagery on some kind of uh, event potentials, we can maybe concentrate on a, on a more complex constructs. So in our case, we had the two dancers training to use semantic BCI for two months, and they both of them selected four uh, psychosomatic states. So it, it's not really just emotional state, it was the state which was corresponding also to the kind of dancing, uh, um, let's say, dancing phrase. And uh, they have been training over the uh, June and July to, to use the system. And the idea was that, that by just entering this different state, the state would be picked up by the system, and then this, uh, the image of, this, uh, of, of one yeah. is the end. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but it's called like, it's basically like a stop sign. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so anyway, yes, so you, you basically like, a, it's like a ping pong, but using the video sequences. And, uh, and the last thing which we wanted also to explore, that was this, this idea of neurochoreography. So, so in, logically, if you think about people dancing, you, you think that this is, these are artifacts which will be uh, inflicted into the system. But in our case, we would like to, we were exploring how we can actually use also the motor activity data, which is not an artifact in this case, but also a part of the input for our classifier. And we had really uh, top class classifier of like, uh, uh, which was reducing all the noise and, and trying to make sense out of that. So that just kind of the level of craziness we have been in. <laughs> but the idea was, yes, so they had two dancers, three screens, and we have, at the end, we had four people. And these are some images from the real show. So we had two people. Okay, so you see, uh, basically they were kind of one solo, another solo, and then at the end they, yeah, at the end they had two, two dancers together. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>